Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fourth installment of a webinar series being presented through a partnership of the University of Minnesota Extension and the State of Minnesota Legacy Fund Restoration Evaluation Program. This series focuses on improving restoration practices in Minnesota and surrounding areas. The previous webinars of this series, Really Restoration Records Matter, It's All About Teamwork and Planning for Success in Stream Restoration, were recorded and can be found at the U of M Restoring Minnesota website, uh, the link that you would have gotten to register uh, for this webinar. I'm Wade Johnson with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, also on behalf of the Minnesota Board of Water and Soil Resources, working with the Legacy Fund Restoration Evaluation Program. For our webinar today on rewilding lake shores in Minnesota, Oh, I need to share my screen, which is down here. Go. Ah, for today's webinar, uh, we have three speakers. Um, today's webinar on planning for, oh my gosh, what is going on there? That says planning for success and stream restorations. Oh, I guess that, excuse me, <laughs> on rewilding lake shores in Minnesota. Our first speaker today is Angie Hong. She is the coordinator of the East Metro Water Resource Education Program, uh, local government partnership with 25 cities and county and watershed organizations. In her free time, she enjoys singing, competing in triathlons, exploring the prairies, woods, and waterways of the St. Croix Valley. She also is a mom to an exceedingly active nine-year-old boy. She holds an MS degree in natural resource sciences for, and management with an emphasis in environmental ed from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities and a BS in zoology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Read up on her tips and tales about cleaning, uh, keeping water clean at the www eastmetrowater.org. Great site, and Angie has a lot of great resources to the, there. Um, today, she'll be discussing implementing shoreline uh, landowner surveys and tailoring those communications for engagement approaches. After Angie, we'll be hearing from Mike Eisensee, who is the administrator of the Cornelian Marine St. Croix Watershed District, um, which is a watershed district in the Northeast Washington uh, County and encompasses 31 lakes, 22 streams, and 18 miles of the St. Croix River. Mike works closely with the East Metro uh, Water Resource Education Program to promote and incentivize natural shoreline restoration. The district engineer firm and landowners to implement district rules that prohibit the use of riprap unless bioengineering techniques are deemed infeasible to address the shoreline erosion. So great topics. Today, Mike will be talking about uh, using that survey information Angie is presenting on to engage individual landowners and contractors to implement the watershed district rules using bioengineering and how the survey data is driving their watershed districts planning for a sustained shoreline education program and their 10 year management plan update. And then lastly is Jeff Forrester with the Minnesota Lakes and Rivers. Jeff has been the director of Minnesota Lakes and Rivers for almost 20 years. His book, Forest for the Trees, How Humans Shape the North Woods uh, from the Univer uh, Minnesota Historical Society Press examines fire and the forestry in the Northern Minnesota Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. This summer, uh, Minnesota Lakes and Rivers is launching a lake steward program statewide. The pilot is on Gull Lake, uh, successfully protected and enhanced over two miles of shoreline last year. Jeff lives with his wife and two daughters and dogs in Minneapolis and spends as much time as he can on the family land adjacent to the Boundary Waters. Um, during the uh, webinar today, please, we welcome you to ask any questions you have using the Q&A feature and Zoom. We'll have 15 or 20 minutes at the end of the presenters to field questions that you might have. If you're having any technical issues, use the chat feature in Zoom and uh, one of the panelists can help get you back on track. We're gonna stop the webinar today a couple minutes before one. Um, and as soon as you shut down Zoom, you'll receive a pop-up asking you to fill out a survey. 
this is a fairly straightforward survey and we'd really appreciate your feedback here on your interests and in webinar topics for the future and how we can improve future webinars as we're hoping to continue this series uh, in, this, in the fall. Um, as I mentioned before, these webinars are recorded and will be available at the Extension website with the link you see there. Uh, so this series and uh, other content you can find there. Um, as I mentioned, this is a partnership between the University of Minnesota Extension uh, Ecological Restoration Training Collaborative, also known as the Restoring Minnesota Program. And they offer an ecological restoration certificate. Uh, this is an 150 hour program uh, with five required courses that really focuses on the fundamental topics in ecological restoration. This is a great opportunity, both as an introduction uh, or as a refresher on really the important topics in implementing and planning ecological restoration around the Midwest. And also um, us with the State of Minnesota Legacy Fund Restoration uh, Evaluation Program are collaborating here. Um, our work is directed in statute by the Minnesota legislature to provide some oversight for the legacy funds and the millions or billion dollars over its life um, of 25 years we're really focused on trying to collaborate with experts to evaluate the outcomes of ecological restoration projects and really focus on what's working, find what's working, find the challenges and find ways to really help share information about improving future restorations. And that is one of the goals of this webinar series for us. Um, and without further ado, I really uh, appreciate this group coming together to uh, talk about rewilding lake shores in Minnesota. Without further ado, I will let Angie Hong take it away. Thank you, Angie. Go ahead and share your screen. Give me one moment. I thought I had it all ready to go and then it kind of <laughs> vanished as an option to share. That's um... So strange, sorry about that. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Wade, for the introduction and for inviting Mike and I to talk about rewilding lakeshores. So I'm going to talk about the people part of rewilding lakeshores. I imagine that most of you listening today are ecologists, biologists, natural resources managers by training. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can learn from social science research and how to develop effective outreach and engagement strategies. And then Mike is going to take it over to talk about implementing rules, some of the assistance that the watershed district offers for bioengineering projects and how that ties in with his watershed district's 10 year management plan. So in short, what we want is a lake that looks something like this. Yes, there's homes, but it is natural. It has native plants, it has trees. There are both emergent and upland plants and it's a relatively wild landscape. In reality, what we often get is something that looks like this. And so there's a big gulf between what we want and what we end up getting. And um, how we convince people to have something that looks more like that first photo is a big challenge. Um, this is gonna seem really rapid, but I'm gonna go through a number of different focus groups and surveys that we've done over the years and what we've learned from them. And the first one was conducted in 2008. There was a student named Ellie Rogers at McAllister University. She was an intern with Great River Greening at the time. And she and I worked together to conduct a survey and a focus group with shoreline owners on Forest Lake. And um, some of the big takeaways from this, one was that only four of all of the people who took the survey or participated in the focus groups had natural or restored shorelines. Um, in terms of their biggest concerns, when we asked them about restoring shorelines, they talked about the cost, ice heaves, the maintenance, and not having the technical expertise to do it on their own. Um, they also saw a lot of advantages in having riprap beach or turf grass. You know, there's an ease of access, it's a tidy appearance, um, there's the ability to re resist the ice heaves, that's a really big problem on some of the big lakes. Um, but they did like the natural look of the native shorelines, uh, thought that it would do a good job of controlling runoff and agreed that the flowers were beautiful. 
Uh, so really the big motivations that we um, realized we could work with people is the aesthetics of having a natural shoreline and um, offering cost share and technical assistance to help them get started. So around that same time, we also did a series of focus groups with people in Woodbury and Cottage Grove. This was a student named Kay Qualley, who was at University of Minnesota in the Cura program. And this wasn't necessarily focusing on shoreline landowners, but it was similar kinds of questions that we were asking them about rain gardens and native gardens. And some of the takeaways from those focus groups were that people were open to the idea of planting and gardening with native plants, but they really want their yards to look attractive and intentional. Um, they also talked about, you know, having cost share grants or technical support would be a big motivation and uh, recommended that we include signage for projects so that when something has happened in their neighborhood and people are walking by, it increases the educational value. They know why, what it is and why it's there. Um, most recently in 2020, just last year, the Carney Lim Marine St. Croix Watershed District sent out a landowner survey to shoreline landowners, received 137 responses. And um, this was part of the watershed management plan. So we weren't specifically asking only about shoreline landscaping, but in terms of the biggest priorities for shoreline landowners, they were talking primarily about aquatic invasive species, clean water and enforcing rules. So um, it wasn't necessarily, I have a unrestored shoreline and I wanna restore it the way we would hope they might be. Um, their biggest concerns were terrestrial invasives, erosion and groundwater contamination. So then the last bit of research that I wanted to share with you, once every five years, we send out a survey to all of the people who work with our office, both the Washington Conservation District and the watershed districts in the county. And these are people who requested a site visit at some point in time, maybe came to a workshop, might have completed a project with cost share funding. And we're just trying to track what the general trends are, what the demographics are of the people that we work with. And if there's a social spread, if you know we work with one person, does that extend to their neighbors or their friends and their family? Um, so unsurprisingly, probably for anybody who's done uh, projects with landowners, the people we work with tend to be older, richer, I would add whiter than the rest of Washington County. Um, it's people who have the time and the disposable income to be able to do a big project like restoring a shoreline and have enough money to live on a lake to begin with. Um, of the people who attended our workshops, 57% schedule site visit, 34% receive a grant for a project and just over 50% install projects. So we've got a pretty good success rate if people come to a workshop or ask for a site visit. Um, they're motivated by protecting lakes from polluted runoff, improving habitat, beautifying their yards and the barriers, not surprisingly, time, funding, um, you may experience this if you begin working on projects. Communication during the project design and installation, these projects can oftentimes you know, stretch out really long. And if you're working with contractors and subcontractors, there ends up being a lot of delays and lack of communication that people get frustrated about. And time and time again, people say they want us to advertise, educate, market more. So the message is that we have dis discovered work the best. Um, the first is just having really, really pretty pictures. Something like this that really looks like a garden. This is something that piques people's attention. And we've incorporated that into the way we are designing rain gardens and shoreline plantings. So for example, in this one, the flowers are all front loaded toward the house so that when somebody's looking out their back window, they see the flowers and more of the grasses and sedges are closer to the shoreline. So it looks more like a garden, more like an intentional planting. Uh, we talk a lot about the wildlife benefits for pollinators, for birds, for turtles, for fishing. Um, that's definitely a motivation for people. And reducing erosion is huge. Um, I always tell people shoreline property is way too expensive to be losing this much of it in only five years time. So uh, people, when they see this photo, um, it, this is a big, a big motivator. 
Um, the other thing that works pretty well with shoreline landowners is talking about geese and scaring the geese away. Geese don't like to be in the tall native plants. And so having a lawn will attract geese, whereas having a native planting tends to keep them away. Um, so we just, this is an image from the DNR that I'm sure you've all seen before, but we work with people a lot to ensure that they can still use their property the way they want to be able to, that they can still have access to the lake, a beach, a dock to get to their boat, a lawn area, but that the majority of that near lake area is something that is native and um, you know, includes both the plants and the shrubs and the trees, something that's going to be more natural and hold the soil in place. Um, we use a whole variety of outreach strategies and I don't have time to go into each of these in detail, uh, but every year we're holding workshops and webinars uh, we're often sending targeted mailings in areas, especially if we have special grant funding to work with people in those communities. I've used neighborhood parties sometimes in the past. If we have somebody who's done a project, they'll invite their neighbors and I can come over and talk about the cost share grant program and um, use those social networks to help get more people in the area to do a project. Having a consistent media president, presence, both social and traditional media offering free site visits through the conservation district and then technical support as well. Those are all key to being able to get these projects to move forward. So I am then going to turn things over to Mike to pick it up from here. We'll have to do a quick stop share reshare. Great, thanks Angie. Yeah. So, so I just wanted you know, reemphasize the importance of the partnership that the Watershed District has with East Metro Water Resource Education Program, which is the shared program that Angie works with, as well as the Washington Conservation District, um, which uh, they, they have technical staff uh, that can work with our landowners. <clears throat> and then we connect all of that together uh, through our rules and in the rules developing um, developing tools for uh, folks to use either the conservation district staff or contractors to make sure that through the permitting process we can get shorelines that comply with the rules and implement bioengineering. So just a quick overview of the Carnelian Marine St. Croix Watershed District. Uh, as Wade said, we're up in the eastern portion, uh, northeastern portion of Washington County along the St. Croix River. Uh, the map on the right, uh, the green areas are highlight uh, the wetlands in the district. And then we have 31 lakes and 21 streams, which are harder to see along the eastern edge of the watershed district. Those are primarily cold water streams uh, flowing into the, the St. Croix River. And then we've got lots of miles of St. Croix River. So our, our section five rules uh, that deal with uh, shoreline and stream bank alterations are extremely important and it ends up by consuming uh, a lot of my time uh, out in the field. So typically, uh, th this is a fairly a typical scenario where uh, we receive a call from a landowner who's having erosion issues on the shoreline and uh, they can see lots of problems. Uh, and so part of what we do, uh, with the lessons that we've learned from Angie's survey, is we start with uh, we start with some uh, discussion about uh, you know what are the natural functions uh, from uh, a native shoreline that are still in place and that are working uh, in favor to address a lot of these issues. So going back here, uh, one of the things that uh, that is a real big deal, is, and this is uh, Big Carnelian Lake on uh, in the district, um, is the the presence of shoreland trees. So the lake was uh, traditionally all shoreland trees, similar to Terrapin Lake here. Uh, and so of course, when shorelines develop, we lose a lot of the trees and shrubs. And so um, pointing out that, it, it, you know, looking at that sand beach shoreline that is in fact eroding, uh, the, the, the primary component that's keeping that together is the root mass for that woody vegetation. So we talk about, uh, we talk about woody vegetation and its benefits um, and, uh, and how we can incorporate that in with the bioengineering design. Um, so, so this is where we really started with our bioengineering design, uh, which is a you know coir log tow and then a restoration of native plants up the shoreline. And this is a standard cross section and understanding that in that last scenario that we're looking for, the other piece that folks are looking for is is beach space. So we we find balances between 
between uh, shoreland restoration and use uh, by shrinking the beach um, a little bit and getting edges uh, with uh, vegetation reestablished. So we learned pretty quickly that you know there there are lots of concerns with this typical uh, cross section. What I hear a lot is ice ridging uh, destroys these uh, muskrats uh, love burrowing in at the water level, uh, wakes from uh, recreational boating and skiing, uh, and then also beach access. So uh, one cross section never solves all the issues. So we have a whole bunch of them. Uh, the that that are uh, <clears throat> you know the integrate uh, armored toe. Uh, with the bio, but with with the bio, biological components of the shoreline. So, in the upper left-hand corner, you can see a a, a typical uh, typical shoreline cross section that we put in for uh, or recommend for shorelines that have uh, wave action issues, muskrat issues, um, where the the wave is breaking on the the toe for smaller wakes, not wake boat wakes. Um, and then we're establishing the vegetation up gradient of that. On the right side uh, of the screen, that's a modification that we've created uh, for our lakes that have um, a, a large and growing population of wake boats on the shoreline. And it essentially incorporates a, a front end uh, wave break uh, with, a, with a percolation trench behind it uh, that is then, uh, that then supports native vegetation and it takes the, the energy out of the wave, uh, because with most of our soil loss and erosion actually occurs in the pullback portion of that wake. Um, and then the bottom one uh, really addresses the ice ridging. So more of the, uh, the anchor boulders, um, and then we, we also promote a lot of vari variation for uh, the height of the rock uh, at the toe, and then making sure that we've got substantial size uh, anchored into the soil to make sure it doesn't move during those ice ridging um, moments. So some other tools that we use, uh, we're, we've been working really hard on education. So this is Big Carnelian Lake. Um, one of the things that I think is important uh, for folks living on the lake to understand is that, you know, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing a massive accelerated loss of shoreline and it has real impacts on water quality. So a lot of our a lot of our education and outreach uh, with folks on the lake is really just making sure everybody understands uh, this piece and that their individual actions and shorelines have a have a real impact. Then we provide uh, stuff like standard planting lists and um, some pretty radical ideas uh, in cross sections and designs. By the way, this one hasn't been implemented yet, but I uh, I'm still confident we're only a year and a half or two years in with this, but I think uh, we can bring back some of the habitat that we're missing uh, on the lake with the right landowners. Then as Angie mentioned, uh, we can also, if we have an eroding shoreline, really it's, um, it, it's always a debate. It's actually a, a lot easier having, at this point, having a conservation district uh, designer design the bioengineering cross section instead of trying to pull a contractor through the process. Uh, so uh, on occasion, when we've got a severely eroding shoreline and a landowner uh, who is really interested in doing a bioengineering approach, we'll connect them with the conservation district um, and provide technical assistance for design. And then we do have a cost share program. And so uh, we, we typically cost share one to two uh, larger scale bioengineering shoreline projects. And I think that the goal uh, for, for me for the project is, um, for the cost share approach is that uh, bioengineering can be, you know, 30 to 35 percent more expensive than a typical riprap shoreline. So that's really been where the district has landed uh, the last couple of projects for cost sharing is uh, covering the, the cost differential between what the landowner would pay to riprap the shoreline versus installing a bioengineered shoreline per our specs. So we're getting we're getting a number of success stories. So here's one on Big Marine Lake. This was the existing condition. There's actually uh, this is a small section. Uh, this is about half of the shoreline. The other half is on the other side of the dock, but uh, I, and that area was eroding uh, at a much greater rate. Uh, but you can, but I think this is a great success because we're getting the toe stabilization, and um, this is with it, it first planted. Uh, we're not only getting herbaceous vegetation, but also uh, trees and shrubs reintegrated back into the, the shoreline and, and more of an urban lake aesthetic, but uh, that catches the, the catches balance between 
um, our net native shoreline restoration and use. So our next step uh, in the process is we're really working hard to transition to more of a proactive model, uh, working one-on-one -on -one with landowners when they call and are ready to transition the, their shoreline or uh, coming out uh, because we got a call be because they're rip wrapping the shoreline without a, a, a permit. Um, that's the, really the most difficult and time consumptive way to approach this issue. So our, our 10 year education plan uh, it really focuses on on four measurable goals awareness increasing awareness understanding motivation and behavior change and by behavior change i really think what we're what we're looking for is we're looking for a uh, a measurable increase in natural uh, shoreline uh, or implementation of bioengineered shorelines across the uh, across the, the lakes and the watershed um, in the lower right hand corner there's a great uh, webinar that just uh, was presented back in March of this year, which is a summary of a, a project uh, that was done quite a while ago in Wisconsin by uh, Brett Shaw, who's a, a social sociologist, and John Hack, who was a with the DNR and is now retired. Uh, but it does a great job of summarizing the, the tools and the motivations uh, for, for, for landowners, like what are the tools that you have and, and how do you approach uh, actual changes in behavior and changes in motivation. And this is really the model that we're going with. So when we look at our programs uh, from, a, from a larger scale for shoreland owners, there's a number of issues that uh, we want to address. Um, and some of, those, uh, some of those issues are really awareness and understanding. Um, and others, it's, we're really more focused on not only building that awareness and understanding, but also implementing more social tools uh, to increase motivation and behavior change. Um, so, so this is our this is our current uh, uh, vision or, or approach for that overall program. Um, and then, and then the 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 follow up question then is well you know, how do we know if it's working? So it, we're conducting, we're planning to conduct baseline surveys in 2022 uh, with landowners and then uh, also vegetation surveys and then uh, revisit those in 2024 and 2030 in order to, uh, the midpoint to adjust our programs if we're not being, uh, if we're not getting the outcomes that we desire. And then in 2030 to basically summarize the impact of our education uh, rules and shoreline cost share programs. Uh, and that is all I have, so I think I will pass it back. Thank you. Are you passing it back to me or to Wade? I think I think it goes back to Wade, or does it go right to Jeff from here? Yeah, I was like, I'm hey, pretty welcome. sure it's not coming back to me. I think it's no, Wade. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Angie and Mike. Very uh, greatly appreciate it. It's great to hear those stories. Uh, we'll pass it right on to Jeff Forrester now. Jeff, are you ready? I'm ready. I need you to start my video, though, I think. I think if you look at where your picture is with your name in the upper right corner of that, you should, yeah. there you go. Okay, great. And I will share my screen and hopefully I'll be able to find what I'm looking for. So yes, I'm Jeff Forster with Minnesota Lakes and Rivers Advocates. We're uh, an organization of lake associations and lake home and cabin owners. So the people that own shoreline, we also have some marina owners, uh, resort owners, um, people that are interested in lakes uh, or a specific lake for some reason. Um, uh, there's about 250 MLR uh, lake association members out of a universe of about 500. And like you, we've struggled for ways to get people to restore their shore or protect their shoreline. Um, what happens on the land determines what happens in the lake. And this has been kind of a constant theme with us for some years, uh, but the message is, is, can be hard to carry through to the point where people act on it. Um, we have the Shoreline Management Act 
1869. So we're going on 50 years of talking about uh, minimum standards, uh, distances from shore, uh, preserving lakeshore vegetation, um, no intensive clearing of trees, no use of pesticides or fertilizers uh, in the impact zone. Um, and this is what we have. And my question has been, um, you know, why? And we can point to the Shoreland Management Act. There's a lack of enforcement, yes. Uh, you know, it's hard to claw back land that's already been developed. Um, but how can we help that? My bigger question was why do owners choose to do that? And I think part of it is they bring an aesthetic from a different part of the state, um, buy a lake shore lot and they walk to that lake shore lot and they look out over it and they imagine the place they came from. Uh, I think pride and social standing is a big piece of it. They wanna have a well manicured lawn, neat and tidy. Uh, they, you know, variance boards are, are tend to grant variances because of property tax pressure and, and markets. Um, they want a view. And I also think there's a need for a sense of control that, that people like to feel like they've got a landscape that they can manage. Um, so how the Lake Steward program came to be, it was uh, first developed on Gull Lake two years ago. They're a member of Minnesota Lakes and Rivers. And it, it really begins with a quiz, a site visit, an award, and then hopefully that drives the publicity of the award drives more uh, people taking the quiz. Um, I remember when the DNR Score Your Shore came out, I thought it was revolutionary. I emailed it out to a lot of our members and, and people liked it. Some started to kind of develop shoreline programs around it to point their members to it, uh, you know, based on kind of the the response we got is it didn't get a lot of traction. Um, Michigan uh, kind of upgraded it. And then a woman on Gull Lake who was a doctor, she was a physician, she had just retired. And somehow she came across this online survey and she was really proud of her place. And she thought it's, it's neat, it's tidy, I, I, there's no junk around. I'm gonna knock this out of the park. And they had had this cabin on Lake, uh, on Pelican Lake for like 25 years and she took the quiz and failed it. And that was the hook for her. She was, you know, how could this be? Um, so she became, she went to the board and she, she and two other friends started this Lake Steward program. So it begins with some coordinators uh, from each lake association. If they wanna participate, they give me the names of the coordinator they received the results from an MLR score your shore, which is a really condensed 10 question version of it. Um, the coordinators ask the candidates for permission to visit the property. Uh, they do a site visit uh, either when the property owner is there or sometimes not, and then they follow up with them. Uh, they connect the owners if they need resources. So a lot of the programs, people in your roles are running uh, matching grant programs, things like that, um, you know, design opportunities. Um, then when the score, when the shoreline meets the standards, fulfills the 10 criteria, uh, they get an award, which is a, a sign you'll see later. Uh, we take a photo of them uh, with the sign and their shore and then do newsletter articles about it for uh, both at the state level and our organization and at the local lake association level. Uh, here's a copy of the sign and notice that it has the Lake Association logo in the, on the bottom there. Uh, it's an attractive sign, well made. Uh, and here's a picture of the people with their signs. And this is the key to the program, right? The sign. Uh, it's so simple, but you put the sign on it and people are just delighted when they get these signs. They're really excited about it. And they put it out on the end of the dock and other people come by and they see the sign. And this helps the Lake Association really get exposure. So they've been very anxious to carry this program. I was concerned that it wouldn't take off. Um, we've done one webinar on it and I did one email announcement of it. And uh, we have over 30 lakes that are 
interested in, in having a lake steward program uh, this coming summer. Uh, and I think it's that piece of the sign and the shoreline it represents represent the mission of the organization. And so anybody that's, you know, trolling past or out on the water, out skiing or something, they're going to see the sign. They're going to see the restored shore or protected shore. They're going to connect it with the Lake Association and the work they do. Uh, and that's kind of a powerful cycle. For in the Gull Lake chain, they started their pilot in 2019 and they had 23 lake stewards to begin with. Uh, the next year, it almost doubled to 51. And if you look at that map, what I think is really powerful are the clusters. So, you know, one or two or a couple of people would become lake stewards and then the neighbors become lake stewards. And so to me, that indicates a shift in aesthetic. Uh, where, you know, you look at a lot that's, you know, clean and tidy and lawn right down to the water and everything is manicured and the grass is green and there's no weeds uh, and the, you know, lake, the weeds in the lake, the aquatic plants in the lake are cleared away. People are starting to see that differently um, and to value the native shoreline and say, wow, they're doing a good job managing their shoreline. So the respect of your peers uh, is a big deal. Um, on the site visit, when they go, if the owner's absent or if they're there, um, you know, they measure the buffer zone, they measure the distance to the shoreline, so we have a record of that, take photographs, uh, identify the plants, are they native, are they, um, you know, nursery plants, uh, you know, introduced species, um, are, are they using, is there evidence that they're using uh, fertilizers or herbicides or even pesticides, uh, and Kind of take a you know how many trees what what percentage of the shoreline is uh, natives uh, in the uh, in the lot um, how many of the trees are natives uh, how many trees are there um, one of the things that they're working with this year on Gull Lake and Minnesota Native Landscapes is using a uh, virtual restoration process so Minnesota Native Landscapes has developed a a sheet. Uh, and a ta they have a tablet and they, the, the volunteer fills out the sheet um, and enters it into the tablet. And then Minnesota Native Landscapes can take a look at what's going on uh, with the shoreline. This is a point that gets a lot of wave activity and there was a lot of erosion. And then Minnesota Native Landscapes can throw in a bid uh, on here's a design, here's what we suggest. Um, so this process creates an opportunity to connect people with greater resources. This is also something that a uh, watershed district, soil and water, you know, whoever is available to do this kind of work could be connected because the, the volunteers um, are not trained, uh, you know, landscape architects necessarily or, or people that do this kind of work professionally like yourselves. Um, they have some knowledge. There is a training course required for the volunteers that they have to take. Um, but they know enough to know who to connect people to. So we have a long list of resources that we've given to the volunteers that they can reference and then pass on to the owner, make those connections to get the work done so that people can get uh, the sign and become a lake steward. Um, the criteria basically you know, 25 foot buffer zone, at least minimum, uh, changes to the upland zone, uh, and then um, native plants in the aquatic zone. There's 10 questions on the quiz. Five, the volunteers can confirm at the site. Five, like, do you spray for mosquitoes? Um, are you using fertilizer on your lawn? we have to rely on the owner's uh, answers. We're not digging in people's garden sheds looking for um, Roundup, you know. But I think you can get a pretty good idea of where people are at when you're on their property. And while the standards, the criteria for Lake Steward, we're, we're trying to hold kind of a minimum standard, a, a, a basic line so that there's consistency 
around the state. This is very much of an introductory um, program. So, you know, people that have no development on their shoreline, well, they would win the sign uh, kind of right out of the gate. And there's some of those. But those who have to restore need to connect with people like yourself. So now they're coming in uh, motivated and uh, the barriers I hope are taken down somewhat. And, and instead of you know, the outreach from the state agencies and local resource managers trying to bring people in, hopefully we can get the people to start pushing towards um, the resources that you have to offer. Um, in the buffer zone, we want native plants. Uh, at least 75% of the shoreline has buffer. Um, you know, fire pits, leaves, pet waste, things like that. Um, the volunteers are looking for, you know, an obvious evidence of stormwater runoff. Um, with there's riprap present, they're allowing plants to grow into it or maybe even doing plugs or trees. 50% um, of the upland is native trees, shrubs, and plants. Um, and But these are the five that are hard. Fertilizers, uh, mechanical removal only of the least amount of aquatic plants possible to get the boat in and out. Uh, septic systems are hard to assess, um, but we do connect people with the no and low cost loan program to upgrade septic systems. And part of the training is a link to a septic uh, maintenance webinar that we did last year. Uh, the idea of leaving fallen trees in the water to provide habitat. Uh, and then the idea of your shoreline infrastructure, your boat lifts and, and docks and all these things, instead of just scattering them out over the shoreline, having a, you know, containing them and stacking them. So there's the least amount of impact. And this is a big piece too, that Dorothy and uh, the other women on Gull Lake is, is relentless positivity. So it's really about what the owner wants. Um, Dorothy said she you know, failed her quiz. And the first thing she did was she stopped mowing within 25 feet of the shoreline. And that second year of no mowing, natives started to come up, flowers and so forth. So then she got excited, um, but she had to move at her own pace. And once she saw the wildflowers coming out of what had once been her lawn, and she realized that she still had plenty of place to play with her grandkids and play badminton and so forth. Um, she went in deeper. So it's kind of that, you know, they take the quiz because they've got some curiosity. They meet with their neighbors and people from the Lake Association as a result. Uh, and they get a really positive message as to, well, you know, oh, how do you use your lakeshore? How do you, uh, what do you do here? Oh, you play croquet. Oh, you, um, like to fish, you know, whatever it is, and then build on that. Uh, and people, like I said, are really delighted with their signs. Uh, it, it is kind of an emotional thing. You know, people sit when they have a lakeshore property and if it's lawn right down to the water and it's, it's not a good shoreline design for protecting water quality, they still love that space. They love that view. And then through this program, when they change it, uh, when they change that aesthetic, when they change that dynamic and they've done some work uh, based on knowledge, on, on new knowledge, they get really, really excited. Uh, and it's kind of great to see. Um, again, the logo on the signs is kind of a big deal for the lake associations. It solves a, a good problem for them. Uh, and we're hoping to get, um, you know, Lake Steward up and running across the state of Minnesota. Uh, Gull Lake uh, is just over two miles of shoreline that's now in the Lake Steward program. So uh, hopefully you'll be hearing about this in, in, in your work. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jeff. And Julia Bonin is here to field some Q&A questions. Great, thank you all very much. Those were um, great presentations and I'm very intrigued. Wish I owned some land shore or some lake shore that I could restore. Um, so we do have a few questions and keep those coming in um, to keep us busy for the next uh, say 12 minutes or so. 
Um, let's start with how do you get lakeshore owners involved and motivated to convert their shorelines to a more natural landscape, given the limited resources such as cost share funds and technical support? Angie, do you want to address that first? Sure, yeah. Um, I did type a message in the Q&A as well. It's definitely, I will say, it is more challenging um, because we've even observed among different watersheds in Washington County, some offer more cost share grants, uh, you know, perhaps up to $5,000 and others only offer up to $500. And we definitely observe a difference in how many people uh, do pursue a shoreline planting project when they have cost share funding versus not. Um, I think sometimes you can find opportunities when people are already planning a major re-landscaping project or perhaps they have a retaining wall that fell down. They're gonna to have to replace it and that's kind of an opportunity to insert yourself and well, if you're going to have to pay to redo a retaining wall, wouldn't you rather just go with this native planting approach instead as long as you're going to have to do something. Um, but yeah, it, it, I mean, it definitely, is a challenge to, um, you know, to get people to do something that's potentially expensive without help. Jeff, do you have anything to add to that? Well, yes, I would say connect with uh, the Lake Association for sure. Uh, for instance, Gull Lake is working now with their lake, st their lake steward uh, volunteers are working to uh, educate uh, variance boards on shoreline restorations. Uh, they're trying to identify the people in their area that do landscaping work. So building porches and retaining walls and all that kind of stuff and get them educated in it. Um, they're reaching out to realtors uh, with studies about water clarity and shoreline quality and the value of lakeshore. Um, so like there's people in the, in, the, in the lake associations that are really engaged on this stuff and you can find them. They're the ones that are running it. And it, it's interesting to me, you know, I, I don't have a scientific background in, in shoreline restoration, but in I think four of the lake steward programs um, that are gonna launch this summer, they have retired resource managers on their boards. So you're going to find those people. Um, and it, you know, a lot of these places start as social clubs and then there's be problems begin with the lake and they become more engaged in management. Um, but you still got those strong social ties there. So, you know, there's that peer pressure piece that I think you can leverage. Great. Thank you, Mike. I'm going to go to you for this one. Um, what are the general maintenance require, requirements for naturalized restored shorelines that lake shore homeowners should be made aware of, if any? Yes, yeah, so, so the, the, the primary piece, uh, two primary pieces, the first one's watering in, within the first year uh, to get the plants rooted in. Uh, and then the second component is weeding. So uh, each, each project has a little bit different challenge um, in our sandier areas. We really struggle with crabgrass establishment. And um, so, so as part of the, uh, as part of the design, we have a maintenance plan that includes that first season watering and then, uh, then basically hand pulling. Um, and we have a recommended seed mix uh, for, uh, because of, for when weeds are pulled, depending on what the, um, what the base layer material is. Uh, so a lot of times we'll use like a, like a net free blanket. So when they pull it up, it pulls up a section of exposed soil. And so do a uh, seed mix with some sand uh, in there, a native seed mix with sand that matches the, the seeding for the shoreline um, and pat it in. But those are really the, the, the biggest pieces um, that we've seen so far. I don't have any other real, uh, real challenges with that one. Okay. So it's good to know they, they do kind of come with instructions for how to manage them, at least for the short term. Correct. That's helpful. Yeah. And Mike, can you address really quickly um, the cost difference again between riprap and the native shoreline? Um, I think some people were a little bit surprised about that. Yeah, so, so I, the, um, the question is, you know, what's the, what's the design solution for the shoreline? And so uh, 
when when we're doing a bioengineered shoreline for a shoreline that uh, experiences regular ice heaving, for example, uh, we're still using the same quantity of rock, uh, but we're now adding a uh, coir blanket uh, and sometimes we have to import uh, material. Uh, so it's a sand peat mixture as well as the purchase of plants. <clears throat> and so they tend to be between 30 to 35% more than a typical, you know, come in, get the slope three to one, put down fabric and riprap. Um, the, but, that, but the other, the flip side of that is that we have quite a few shorelines that don't actually need rock. And so when we're working with alternative materials and removing the rock, then those projects tend to be less expensive than a riprap shoreline. Okay, great. Um, Angie, I'm gonna throw this one out your direction. To be clear, um, is there a set policy for the width of buffer and the amount of shoreline? And does that vary by regions or lake associations at all, or is it statewide? It's, um, I mean, there, there are differences from watershed to watershed. I mean, there, there are DNR shoreline rules that apply to what area you can clear. But a lot of times we're dealing with, um, as Jeff was saying, areas that were already developed back in the 50s or 60s. So. Uh, when the watershed districts are looking at giving cost share grants for restoration, uh, they're generally having some kind of requirement that it needs to be maybe at least 15 feet wide before they would give a cost share grant, um, just so that there's some kind of ecological benefit. And a lot of times the watershed districts do have additional buffer rules that go above and beyond what the DNR state shoreland standards are. Jeff, I have a couple questions uh, to throw your direction. Um, how many lake associations do you currently have participating in your in the Lake Steward program? It's a it's about thirty, and this is the first year of it. This is year one, so they're kind of coming in and dribs and you know drabs. I don't know what the final number will be. Um, It'll great to be be great to see in a couple of years uh, where you're at with that. If you have thirty now. Right. And, you know, some of them are really big lakes, uh, Green Lake, Vermilion, Gull, uh, and then lots of the smaller lakes. So, you know, and even some in uh, Ramsey County, I think, are going to start it. So we've got urban and then very, um, you know, wild lakes like Vermilion. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. And the standard is 25% of the shoreline uh, only 25% of the shoreline uh, can be developed. The rest of it has to be uh, buffer zone uh, up to, you know, at least 25 feet deep from the water. So I assume then if you if you're only you're into your second year of this, you maybe haven't um, measured kind of the impacts of having these restored shorelines on the lakes that are particip participating in your program. Well, you know, we'll be able to tell how many feet of shoreline has been protected or restored, things like that. I have spoken with uh, Paul Radomsky to see if there's some way we can measure changes in the lake over time. Like if a certain percentage of property, you know, is there a tipping point where- Right, so would you measure things like uh, water quality in terms of clarity or? Well, the lake associations, most of them do that. So they've got secchi disc readings and they've got water quality analysis going back, you know, fish counts and stuff going back years and years. Um, so we've got that data. Um, now can we assess, you know, how do we assess it? What do we look at? And uh, Paul's looking at some of the measurements. It's not restore your shore. What was the next iteration of that, of his study? Um, there was, you know, restore your score your shore, restore your shore, and then there's one other, but he had different criteria that he was using for this current uh, iteration of the shoreline protection program. And we've been meeting kind of once a month. And I think we're, we're gonna get into that. That's a piece I'd like to add. Okay, Jeff or Mike, I'd like to ask the same question of you. You know, are you doing any kind of measurements and seeing any kind of impacts for over time? Yeah, quality? that's our goal. Yeah, that, that's our goal. We're just wrapping up our 10 year, our draft 10 year management plan for the district. And so our goal is to take our 10 rec, our 10 highest recre, highest recreational use lakes and get some baseline data on uh, shoreline condition, uh, vegetation type, um, and then uh, 
do the sur survey that at three three points during the plan period as well angie and i uh, are going to be working in partnership to develop a baseline survey in 2022 for representative uh, sampling of shoreland owners that uh, measures more of the the softer sciences for the social sciences for awareness and information and then also some measures for motivation and behavior change so when we bring those two together uh, we're we're planning on having really strong measurable uh, outputs or evidence of success or lack of success from our approaches. I would just add too that the watershed district does work with the conservation district to do water quality monitoring. Um, but I think it would be hard to say that lake water quality improvement was due to shoreline restoration when there's so many other big capital improvement projects that are happening in our area as well. And um, also a lot of conversion of former ag land into natural habitat. So, you know, it will be one of the contributing factors if hopefully water quality continues to trend up, but um, it will be probably hard to say that that's 100% of the reason. Okay, so hard to separate all those uh, factors. Right. That's Angie, I'm going to throw this one to you. Um, oh, sorry, did you, Jeff? Uh, well, Angie said what I wanted to say better than I did, so... <laughs> It's like, what do you look at that yeah. is only the shoreline restoration, you know, mm -hmm. that indicates the shoreline restoration it, causing Yeah, I, I'd and be that, hard pressed to think of an example of a lake where that's the only problem for the lake. Right. So. Angie, I'm going to throw this next one to you um, regarding um, the ice heaves and if you've, if you've, invested in the restoration and you have I'm gonna I'm gonna throw that one to Mike because okay um, I sounds good. yep <laughs> did you see uh, that one Mike about ice heaves um how to deal with repeating ice heaves year after year after year because it right. is an issue that we have in forest lake yeah so 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 the the, the rule in, intentionally notes that bioengineering uh is is the required unless it's uh, deemed infeasible. So we do have an ice heave cross section and the strategy for uh, for that cross section is varying the rock position uh, both forward and backward. So uh, so you don't create a plane, right? Because what happens when that ice heave, when that ice sheet comes in is if it has a level plane of rock, then it lifts together and you still have that ice pushing into the shoreline and then also variable height to give it torsion on the ice uh, this way as well. Um, and so, uh, so, so that's, that's our cross section, but we have had areas on Big Marine Lake where we've got a lot of fetch uh, across the lake and um, steep slopes uh, that there's no opportunity to drop them to even a three to one slope and those really we have no other choice but riprap. Uh, most of the bioengineering evaluations that I've seen dealing with ice heaving is the key is getting as flat of a slope as possible. And so we push for four to one or five to one slopes where we can get them and then they tend to be a lot more stable. But in certain scenarios where we don't have the room that that's not feasible, then we do allow uh, big, big rock to be put in because it has to be large to, um, to withstand the force of those sheets. Okay. I, I think that's going to be really helpful for the person who asked that question. Thank you. Um, Wade, I'm going to turn it back over to you now. We're at a, only about a minute out. So closing comments. Great. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jeff and Angie and Mike. We really appreciate the presentation. And I think there was a lot of meaningful uh, discourse there in the Q&A. So greatly appreciated. Um, and thank you, Julia, for helping field those questions for everybody. Um, this is the fourth and final um, webinar in this series, so thank you everyone for tuning in. I encourage you to stay tuned. Um, we're hoping to have another set of four webinars this fall, so uh, yet to be determined and uh, more to come. Please take a minute to take the survey that will pop up uh, as soon as you close Zoom. It really is meaningful feedback uh, for us to guide future, future direction. And with that, I think we'll cut it off for the day. Thank you all very much and look forward to seeing more uh, restored and rewilded lake shores in the future. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.